From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, returning your call. Oh, hi, Pat. How Southern California? My vacation on expense account, I love it. Well, don't overdo it. Just because the Jolly Roger matter interfered with that vacation you'd planned is no Now, reason. wait a minute, you promise, full expenses. <laughs> okay. When are you coming back to Hartford? Soon as I clear up the Lamar case. One okay expenses on it now? Huh? Lamar? Yeah, Pat. This is a case that'll make your hair curl. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Expense account? Ah, forget it. I'm on vacation. As far from Hartford, Connecticut, center of the insurance business as I can get. Yeah, I'm in La Jolla, California. And I'm staying in a big, ritzy motel called El Crescenta. Alone. Oh, there is a girl down here. A lot of them, in fact. But one in particular. Bonnie Lamar, her name is. Sounds like somebody in show business, doesn't it? But she isn't. Tall, five feet eight, brunette, pretty as the devil. And I gave her the line that my so-called business back east consists of nothing more exciting than running a filling station. How can you afford to come all the way out here to California for a vacation? To say nothing of staying at the El Crescenta. Rich uncle, Vonnie. Died and left me a couple of thousand to do with as I see fit. This is the way I see fit. Only a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Gee, that's too bad. A couple of hundred thousand, I might really fall for you. Oh, Vonnie, how can you? Hmm? Well, here I thought these last three days and evenings with you were due solely to my overwhelming personal charms. Your charm has nothing to do with it. Kiss me again, anyhow. With money around, who needed a couple of hundred grand? Yeah, the gal was just about all anyone could ask for. And I don't mean for just a quick vacation time romance. I'd spotted her the minute I'd landed here at this hotel. More like a guest ranch by the seashore. Beautiful, modern cottages set around a big green lawn with a swimming pool in the center big enough for the Olympics. Carports beside the cottages loaded with Eldorados, Continentals, and a handful of foreign sports jobs. And a beautiful big dining room and a building set up to look like an old clipper ship. And food and service worthy of Oscar of the Waldorf. And what was I doing here? On expense account, remember? Yeah, I'd spotted Vonnie the night I arrived from San Diego after clearing up the Jolly Roger matter and set my sights for her immediately. Naturally, I wondered what so attractive a girl was doing alone here. She cleared that up for me at dinner the second night. I still don't understand why Daddy hasn't arrived yet. Oh? He's supposed to join you on this vacation? We always spend our vacations together. At least we have since Mother died a few years ago. You're an only child? Yes. Really, a foster child... Just as we were about to take our plane, some crisis or other arose at the plant. <clears throat> so he made me come along and wait for him. Lamar Metal Products. Lamar Metal... Oh, yeah, yeah. Aircraft components, isn't it? South Bend, Indiana? Yes. You know how crisis can arrive in a business like that. Sure, I imagine so. Government orders. All that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you'll probably hear from him before. Oh. Hey, waiter, would you like to get us... A... Senor, senorita, a telegram for the lady. Oh, Excuse me, Johnny. Sure. Here you are, Peter. Gracias, Peter. Oh, dear. What's the matter? It's from my father, and I don't like it. Listen. Must delay departure a few more days. Doctor's orders. Oh? Nothing to worry about. Stay there in La Jolla until I join you, love Daddy. Oh, that's too bad. But doctor's orders. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. He had a new insurance examination just a month ago. They gave him a clean bill of health. Uh... What company? 
try mutual something or other, but what difference does it make? There's something wrong about this. I'm sure of it. Well, why don't you phone him? Yes. Yes, I will. My cottage is right next door here. Come on. It was none of my business, but the name of Tri Mutual rang an old familiar bell. Yeah, I'd handle a lot of cases for them. Anyway, she wasted no time in putting through a call to her father's private number in South Bend. Yes, operator? Thank you. I don't know why I didn't go to my own cottage to make this call. Mm, my pleasure. I guess I'm a bit upset by this wire. I don't blame you. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. There can't be. Well, maybe he just made the mistake of mixing too many oysters with too many martinis. Hello? Or... Hello? Daddy, what's this telegram you sent me? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, well, you had me scared for a few minutes. Oh, yes, fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, if you must know the truth, I have. Johnny Dollar. Uh-oh. Very. Careful, gal. Oh, he says he runs a filling station, but I don't believe him. <laughs> I'll tell you all when you get here. And hurry, darling, please. All right, Daddy. Good night, dear. Oh, thank goodness. You don't know how close your guess was, Johnny. Oh? It was just a slight case of indigestion. Plus the fact he wanted another day at the plant. Well, good. Then let's go back to the dining room and see what kind of indigestion we can accumulate. Well, that started it. Three days and nights of as much fun and relaxation as I've had in years. A wonderful place to stay, a private beach that I'll wager is second to none on the Pacific coast... Swimming, water skiing, skin diving, sailing, everything. Oh, this was it. Or so I thought. Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with one. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I... I... I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, whoa, gal. Mm hmm? It'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Vani. And I mean the forever kind. Well, would that be so terrible? Well, you've, you've got one big strike against you, you know. Johnny, what? M-O-N-E-Y, money. <laughs> you lose. Huh? I have nothing, except what my father gives me. You know, allowance and for clothes and things and... <laughs> you know. So you see, I'm just as poor as you are. Only you aren't. Or you wouldn't be staying at a place like this. Another thing. You know absolutely nothing about me. <laughs> I know you don't make a living by running any old filling station. Johnny Dollar at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Oh, stop. Well, for all you know, I'm a, I'm a gangster, a safecracker, a jewel thief. Mm. Or worse still, playboy scion of a wealthy family who never did a lick of work in his life. In other words, a worthless bum. Don't say that, Johnny, even in fun. Had you fill them, huh? Yes, and their mothers. Old dowagers trying to marry them off to another wealthy family. Add the name Lamar to their end of the social register listing. Ensure the fortune with another fortune. I thought you said you were poor. Well, you know what I mean. A bunch of worthless fops, that's all they are. I've seen better men among the servants and chauffeurs, the little Mexican boy who helps one of the gardeners, and the young businessmen there in South Bend and in other cities. Maybe earning just enough to make ends meet, but, but men, ambitious, hardworking, willing to get somewhere on their own merit. And... Well, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Why don't you marry one of them, Bonnie? It isn't as easy as that, Johnny. You know it. Maybe I was waiting for someone like you to... Mm. I still don't believe in love at first sight. Mm. Good. Let me snuggle again. Like before we started this horrible discussion. Mm-hmm. sun's going down, though, honey. And this little niche in the rocks is going to get cold... Hey, look. 
Everybody else has left the beach. Come on, snuggle. I like it. <laughs> Kiss me. And I thought I'd have to ask for it. John, Johnny, what do you do? Well, hmm? well, I'll tell you. I live in Hartford, as I told you, and Wait. I'm really... Listen, he's calling you. Yeah, you too. Oh, the spoil sport. Well, maybe it's a word from your dad. Here, up you come. Oh, I hope so. Come on, Johnny. Pedro? Pedro? Over here. Here we are. Here. What's up? Oh, senor, senorita. Telegrams. Telegrams? But the one for the senor was Mark Rush. So I rush. Good boy, Pedro. Here. No, I'll tip you when we get back to the motel. Stop by my cottage. Johnny, it's... It's... What's wrong, Bonnie? It's from our family doctor. I'm afraid... Here, you read it. Sure, I'll be glad to. Regret having to inform you... Your father died a few hours ago. Suggest you return to South Bend immediately. Oh, Johnny! <laughs> It was a few minutes before Vani could pull herself together enough to walk from the beach up to her cottage where she could pack her things for the trip back to South Bend. I told her I'd make the necessary plane reservations for her. But what I didn't tell her was the contents of the wire I'd received, the one marked Rush. It was from Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. A request to call him at his home in Hartford immediately. I put through the call. Hello, Pat McCracken. Well, Killjoy, what's on your mind? Johnny? That's right. Hey, you got my wire. Why else do you think I'm calling? I tried to get you long distance all day. Your motel didn't seem to know where you were. Well, that was my doing. They might have spoiled a beautiful romance. But what's on your mind? Uh, Johnny, you've got to cut your vacation short. Oh, no, you don't. And you've got to come back to Hartford right away. What? Now, listen, I'm just... Yes, but plan to make a long stopover in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend? That's right. Oh, I get it. This is a gag. Or did you know I'd figured maybe on stopping over there anyhow? I don't know what you're talking about, but now listen. By a rare stroke of luck, we just got word of the death this morning of one of Trimutual's bigger policyholders. How much? A million and a half. <sighs> man named Thomas Rene Lamar. Lamar? Pat! Now listen, Johnny. The circumstances lead us to think it may be murder. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a set of circumstances arise that are enough to keep a man from trusting even himself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your party in Hartford, Connecticut now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Just a moment, please. Hello, McCracken, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. Johnny, are you still in La Jolla? Didn't you get my telegram? Sure did, and I'm getting ready to leave for South Bend right now. In the company of a beautiful, charming, lovely... Now look, son, your vacation is over. Charming, lovely girl named Vonnie Lamar. Okay, okay, now will you... What? That's right, Thomas Rene Lamar's daughter. Does she know her father has died? Telegram for her arrived at the same time I received yours. You didn't show her my wire. No, she doesn't know yet that you think it might be murder. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Patrick McCracken. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Or was it murder? Expense account item one. I'm calling it item one, Pat, because it's really the first tab on the Lamar case. Previous expenses here in La Jolla were charged against the Jolly Roger case. Expenses for the vacation you promised me and have now so rudely interrupted. 
Item one, nine dollars sixty cents for that long distance call to Pat McCracken in Hartford. Now, what under the sun is Vonnie Lamar doing in La Jolla? Vacation. Same as I was trying to take. Now, tell me something, Pat. Uh, has a claim already been filed on Lamar's million and a half dollar policy? No claim has been filed. Well, then how'd you know about his death so quickly? Look, pure and simple. The insurance company is Tri Mutual, big office in Chicago, headed up by Lawrence Comstock. Oh, sure, known him for years. Good man. Well, he's written all of Lamar's policies himself. He got to know the old man pretty well. Uh huh. Personal friends, you know, weekend golf together, same clubs, and both nuts about two handed pinochle. So? Well, Comstock had been Lamar's house guest for the past few days, and been with him practically every minute the old man wasn't at his plant. Was he actually there when Lamar died? Yes, yes. He was the one who called the doctor when the old man keeled over. Look, you keep referring to him as the old man. Just how old was he? Oh, not two. Uh, well, let me see. I've got it. Uh, he was 59. The doctor's name on our telegram was Wilson. You know his first name? No, I don't know. That stuff you'll have to get from Comstock there in South Bend. Okay. Well, at any rate, Johnny, he called me the minute the doctor pronounced Lamar dead and specifically asked that you be put on the case. Yeah, well, that's flattering. Okay, it looks like I am, but tell me something. Yeah? What makes Larry think the man was murdered? I'd rather not discuss it now. He'll, he'll give it to you when you see him. Our plane leaves in about an hour. No doubt you can be of some comfort to the daughter. Hmm? Her knowing that you're handling the case. Pat, that's the one thing I don't want her to know. I hung up, leaving Pat to ponder over that last remark. Wired Larry Comstock that I was coming and finished my packing for the trip back east. When I'd finished, I paid my bill at the fancy motel. And all I can say is, thank goodness it was on expense account. And I knocked on the door of the cottage next to mine. Yes, come in. Oh, Johnny. Hi, Bonnie. Any way I can help you? More than you have? You've been wonderful. Arranging the flight back for me. For us. Taking care of the things here. Johnny. That's right. For us. I'm making the trip with you. But you... I thought you said Hartford, Connecticut. And your vacation. Oh, the vacation's all over. Wouldn't be any fun for me to stay around after this. Oh, darling. And South Bend is along the way. I'd feel better if I kind of took you home rather than let you make the long trip alone under the circumstances. Maybe I have some business or something to attend to there. Darling, I, I don't know what... To... Easy, honey. Well, you, you made it so wonderful when Daddy couldn't get here these last few days. And now that this terrible thing has happened, you stick by me this way. That's the only way I'd have it. You... You're so wonderful. All right. All right. Come on now. Come on, get your things together. I've called for a cab to the airport in San Diego. Come on, Mom. Thank you, Johnny. I love you for this. Sure. I can't say I exactly relish thoughts of the flight back east. Much as I hoped I could be of some small comfort to the girl. Much as I genuinely wanted to. Such things can be pretty rough. Particularly in this instance. But I am an insurance investigator... And in a matter of this sort, a million and a half dollars at stake, the possibility of murder, well, it's up to me to suspect everyone, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I sometimes think it's a pretty rotten racket to be in. Johnny. Sleep, Johnny. Sleep. You'll need all of it you can get before you have to face things at home. I wasn't sleeping. I was just thinking. And being so thankful that you're here with me. Honey, I wired ahead for a hotel reservation. What? Yep. I'm going to stay in South Bend a few days. You wonderful, wonderful... No, no, I'm going to be honest with you. I... I also wired a friend of mine. a Well, a fellow with whom I do business now and then. So I... Well, anyhow, I'll be there for a few days and maybe more. And as long as I can be of any help to you. It's funny. Hmm? You know, you still haven't told me what you do. Well, don't worry about that now. But I'm curious. Tell me. It'll give us something to talk about. Did you wire anyone at your home about your arrival? Yes, Harrison the butler. Johnny. Well, uh, how how about the doctor who telegraphed you? Yes, Dr. Wilson, too. Honey. Wilson, Wilson. Wilson. Edward T. Wilson. Now tell me. No. 
No, no, you you stop talking and try to get some rest. But all... I'm going back to the lounge in the tail section so that you'll have nothing to do but get some sleep. Then you won't tell me. No. no tomorrow. I'll sleep. Thank you, Johnny. No, I... I can, maybe. Yeah, rough. Very rough. I felt like a traitor to her. Well, we landed in Chicago at 10 a.m. and took a cab from the airport to the Lamar home on the outskirts of South Bend. I'd never before realized that the big industrial city with all its huge, dirty, sprawling factories had such a wealthy residential section. And the Lamar home on Parody Lane was one of the most impressive of all, set far back in what must have been an acre of well-kept lawn. In addition to Harrison, the butler, we were met at the door by the housekeeper, cook, upstairs and downstairs, maids, and a couple of other servants, all of them obviously in deep sorrow over the passing of the master of the house. And may I most humbly for all of us express our deepest sympathy in this hour of this... <laughs> it's all... Thank you, Harrison. Thank you all. I'm going to my room and we'll call you when... Uh, yes, miss? This is Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. He's to be admitted to the house any time he... Well, I'll be here, Bonnie, as soon as possible. And you know where to reach me. Yes, Johnny. Thank you. And now to get to work, whether I liked it or not. I took the cab to the townhouse, dumped my bags, then back to Chicago in the office of Lawrence Comstock, Tri-Mutual's representative. He was waiting for me. Well, Johnny, you sure walked into something this time. Thick one, Larry? You don't know. You don't know the half of it. The million and a half of it. You gave Pat McCracken back in Hartford the idea that Lamar's death might be murder. I think it is. I really think it is, Johnny. Why? Tom Lamar was one of the best friends I ever had. He should have been. Your commission on the insurance he was carrying was enough to set you up for life. Oh, no, Johnny, don't talk like that. Tom was a good friend of mine, quite aside from business. I sold him his very first policy years ago, and he was just a bookkeeper for Atlas Processing Company, earning $70 a week. And when he married Delise... Delise? As his wife, who died five years ago. Oh. That policy was only for $2,500, straight life. So? Well, you know how little my commission was on that... But I liked him. I saw that he had a spark about him. That with the proper kind of encouragement, he could go places. And he did. Yeah, so I understand. I understand the Lamar metal products is a really big thing. General metal fabricators just bought them out. Oh? Yes, and Tom was getting all ready to retire. Spend the rest of his days having fun. Golf, fishing, winters in California, and summers in Minnesota, that sort of thing. And taking care of Vani, his adopted daughter. Yeah. Kind of worth taking care of, too. Eh? I know her, Larry. Met her in La Jolla, California. Oh, then you... Brought her back here to face the sad fact of her father's death. Why well, didn't... Oh, yes, of course. The family doctor, Ed Wilson. I should have realized. He sent a telegram to Vani to the same place you were in La Jolla. She's a wonderful girl, John. You're telling me. But, Larry... Yes? Something you told Pat McCracken back in Hartford has led him to think that possibly Thomas Lamar was murdered. John. Johnny, in the years I've known Tom Lamar... Yeah? I've not only known him, but I've known his family. Well? And much of his affairs, personal as well as business. Well? His wife, Delise. I would have married her long ago if I'd been able. Oh, get to the point, Larry. Oh, yes, of course. And his daughter, Lavon. Vonnie. I wish she'd been my daughter, my child. Come on, Larry, come on, get at it. She's him. a wonderful girl. You said that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, there were things in her past, Vani's past, that even her mother and later her father didn't know about. But I did. For heaven's sake, man, get to the point. You too? Yes, me too. Yeah, me. The confirmed bachelor. Take him or leave him. Have fun. Forget him. Make a big... Come on, Larry. Listen, Johnny. Now, listen carefully. Dr. E.T. Wilson, Ed Wilson, an old friend of mine as well as Tom. Yes? It was Ed who made the last insurance examination four months ago. Thomas Rene Lamar was in better health than you are. After all, he was only 59, and he'd lived a careful life, taking good care of himself. Well, go on. We were sure of his physical condition, sure of it. That's why I let him add to his already large policy. Larry... 
You've told Pat McCracken, and you've admitted to me that you think Thomas Lamar was murdered. Yes, John. Because of one man. Who? The one man who shared his confidences, business and person. Yeah? Who was closer to him than even Ed Wilson or me. Well, who? One man who alone could be sure of benefiting by Tom Lamar's death. Oh, look, Larry, that bush you're beating around is getting bigger and bigger. It's so simple, John, so discouragingly simple. <sighs> all right, all right, Larry, all right. Take it any way you like. I'm here for two reasons. Because I'm assigned to this case and because of Vonnie. Yes, I know. Now, who is it you suspect? The man Vani is really in love with. Oh. I'm sorry, John. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some stuff I didn't want to hear, but I had to. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vonnie. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. Is something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie... Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... Listen... Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you, too, think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Vani Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case. Not only because of the million and a half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane. And the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes. You see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. We used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? You said murder. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom. Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, 
You are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. Yes. All right, now tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million and a half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vonnie Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are. Whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. (sighs) Go on, Larry. Well, we know... Ed Wilson and I, I because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, Ed because of his medical knowledge. We know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes of golf. Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played pinochle. Just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired, my years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day at the plan on Monday. And so I suggested we get to bed. He smiled, uh, <laughs> as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. (laughs) But I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his. I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath, broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... you mean you no, think... No, no, I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart, a very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure that's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well... We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marson. Who's Walter Marson? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Levon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I I know how you feel about her. Well, why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head, except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know is Vonnie. Oh, go on. Therefore, the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand. If she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, let him share it. He deserves to, if she wants him to. He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vonnie did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vonnie. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. 
from the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes, handled many of Tom's personal investments, and handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well, rewarded him, always, when he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation, and this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate, or legally proper, perhaps, but not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, right? Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spent his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant. His closest friend. All right, Larry. Let me do a little summing up. Walter Marson failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation, so he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar. Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, no. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it. No. Larry, what if Vani had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You, you say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for her like a ton of bricks. Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, what are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... (sighs) Yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry too, Larry. I... I didn't mean to... I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I guess whatever it is, I, I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Johnny. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me, and with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Edward Wilson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello, Dr. Doctor. Mr. Comstock of Tri-Mutual Insurance asked me to call you. Regarding the death of Thomas René Lamar. Yes. I've just left the police department, the chief autopsy surgeon. Yes? There's no question about it. Thomas Lamar was poisoned. I... I see. I'd like to talk to you, doctor. I understand you were one of Mr. Lamar's closest friends. Yes. And one of the beneficiaries of his will. That's quite... 
Where did you learn that? I didn't. It was a shot in the dark. No, look here, young... Better stick close to your office, doctor. I'm on my way over to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter, now proven to be murder. As the facts of this case lined up, it appeared that Thomas Rene Lamar, wealthy manufacturer of aircraft components, had only two really good friends. Lawrence Comstock, who had issued him a million and a half worth of life insurance policies, and Dr. Edward T. Wilson, and a wonderful, lovely, charming adopted daughter, Laban, whom I'd met during my brief vacation in La Jolla, California, whom I'd accompanied back here to South Bend, Indiana, when she received word of her father's sudden death. What little evidence I'd been able to pick up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, Lamar's personal secretary. Unknown to Lamar, he had married Bonnie, and therefore stood to benefit from his death. Oh, why kid about it? I'd fallen for the girl, heavily. And when I found out that she was already married to a slick, smart promoter... Well, let's keep personalities out of this case. Especially mine. I'd told Vani that I'd come up and see her out at the family mansion. But I thought I'd better contact Dr. Wilson first. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I've heard a great deal about you from Lawrence Comstock. And please, sit down. Thanks, Doctor. You said something over the phone that's bothered me. I won't mince words. Apparently, you and Larry Comstock were Thomas Lamar's closest friends. I don't think there's any question about it, my boy. And I'm sure Lawrence will verify that. He already has. That's why I took a shot in the dark and suggested that you're a beneficiary of Lamar's will. Not his insurance. I already know that his daughter, Vonnie, gets that, but his will. Well, does that shock you? I suppose Larry's a beneficiary, too. Yes. Then... Either one of you might conceivably have had a motive for bringing about his death. What? Now, just a minute, you Relax, man. doctor, relax. I make no bones about it. This is the roughest case I ever tried to handle. Unfortunately, I started out by getting myself emotionally involved with Bonnie Lamar. Well, go ahead, laugh if you want to. Hardly. She's a very wonderful girl. A bit mixed up at times, perhaps, because of... Well... Because of what? Are you aware that unknown to her father, Vonnie was married? Is married? Yes. To some Walter Marson, Larry Comstock told me. Marson was Thomas Lamar's personal secretary. Did Lawrence tell you why she married him? I don't think he knows. It was a few short months after Thomas Lamar's wife died. A terrible blow both to Vonnie, who was completely devoted to her foster mother, and to him. By way of quenching his sorrow, Thomas drove himself in his work 16, 18 hours a day at the plant all his waking hours, so that he would have time to think of nothing but his work. But Vani had no such outlet for her emotions. Her friends, a lot of rich 'er ne'er-do-wells, rich, worthless bums, if you like, got her interested in gambling. She plunged into it with a recklessness and abandon that quickly got her into debt so deeply that there was only one way out. Her father didn't know? No, no, no. But young Marson did, and he took full advantage of it. In return for her agreement to marry him... He promised to quietly obtain the necessary funds from Thomas Lamar's investments, which he, Marson, handled. And he did. And she married him. Yes. But how could she? She didn't love him. And you must realize her emotional state at that time. She was terribly upset over the recent death of her mother, and so was her father, of course. She knew the shock it would be if he ever knew of her gambling and the tremendous debt she'd incurred. She was beside herself, ready to do anything. So she married Marson. I could kill him. Now, let's get one thing straight, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You, too, were a bit upset when you came in here. You spoke as though you might think both Lawrence Comstock and I could have motive for wanting Thomas's death. I'm sorry, Doctor. I... It's true that we are beneficiaries of his will, at least Thomas assured us we were, but only in a very minor way. 
Thomas was loyal to us as he was to the servants who have been so devoted to him for so long. And whatever little he has left us and them... I'm sorry, Doctor. I... Oh, I, I guess I was just feeling hurt and angry and taking it out on anyone I could find. At least that's the way Larry Comstock put it. And he was right. Now I got a job to do. What have the police found out? Only enough to back up my immediate suspicion that Thomas was poisoned by Pirate Dameron. Pirate Dameron? Yes, it's a little-known drug that produces tremendous but only momentary stimulation to the heart, causes the heart to almost literally burst, and it leaves virtually no traceable residue in the system. But you said the chief autopsy surgeon found out... No, no, no. He found only positive indication that Pirate Dameron had been used. I found the first clue to it only minutes after Thomas died... A staining of the tongue that even then was rapidly disappearing. Can you tie this drug in with Walter Marston? No. No, the fact that it was available at all has stumped both the police and myself. The last known source was a small island off the coast of Greece oh, many, many years ago. And all the tiny plants from which it could be obtained as pollen were burned by the Greek government. But somebody, somewhere, must have had some seeds, planted them and obtained this pollen. Yes. How do you suppose Mr. Lamar took the stuff? Well, it could have been mixed with one of the medicines in the cabinet in his bathroom, but we found no traces. Uh huh. Larry Comstock said you used to give him harmless sugar pills as a kind of sedative. Yes. Yeah, Thomas knew they were perfectly harmless, but he occasionally took them anyway. <laughs> it was a kind of joke. Could this uh, pirate stuff have been mixed with them? We found no trace in the bottle. But you would have been able to. Yes. It is only an assimilation by the human body that dissipation is so complete as to make it virtually undetectable. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't been of much help to you, Mr. Dollar. I think you have, Doctor. I think you have. It was only a hunch. But in this business, you sometimes have to depend as much on hunches as on common sense. I picked out the library nearest to the Lamar residence to do my research. Pirate Dameron. You're sure that is the word? Yes. Can't you find anything on the subject? Nothing beyond what you found in the Pharmacopoeia Index, the name of the plant from which it is derived. Blepharia purpurus calandus. No common name. Yeah, no. Well, thanks. Of course, the main branch of the city library in Chicago might have something. Sure, thanks. Why, uh, yes, yes, I'm sure I can find what you're looking for. You see, I myself am quite a student of rare drugs and poisons. Oh, what's that? Well, after a long, dull day here at the library, I enjoy nothing more than curling up in a big chair in my little apartment and reading detective fiction. Oh, well, uh, where's the book? I'll show you. Uh, but quietly, please, we must maintain the proper atmosphere for our readers. Oh, sure. Yes, I know the poison pyrodameron very well. It was used in that wonderful story, The Case of the Yellow-Lipped Monster. Oh, excellent book, thrilling. Oh, you should read it. Yeah, well... Uh... Pyrodameron was new to me, so as usual, I had to find out all about it, and I did find out, too. The plant it's derived from, where it's grown, uh, where it was grown. You see, it's been extinct now for many years. Yeah, I understand. Oh, now... Deadly thing, terribly deadly. But now here is the book that will tell you all about it. The title is Flora Exotica Mediterranea. That means exotic flowers of the Mediterranean. Uh, hmm, Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter? Well, I don't... Oh, good heavens, it isn't here. Are you sure? But it was. I'm sure it was only yesterday. Oh, dear. Well, here, do you see? It was taken out from right here. Well, who took it out? I don't know. Won't your records show? No, I never permit any books to be taken from this section without my knowledge. Oh, never. Afraid somebody'd consult the stuff for ulterior motives? Oh, oh, dear, no. It's just that the only ones who want these books are the rabid whodunit fans like myself. And, uh, well, I like to talk to them. Well, isn't there some other book that might give me the information I want? Oh, not another book in the world. I know. And now, oh, tragedy. It's been stolen. <laughs> Well, this was one time a hunch didn't pay off. Quite the contrary. I'd wasted a lot of time. Expense account item 9, 520. Taxi out to the Lamar mansion. I was almost relieved to learn that Vonnie was not home. I'm very sorry, sir, but she and Mr. Marson left shortly afternoon to make the funeral arrangements. Thank you, Harrison. However, as you know, Miss Vonnie wished you to have full access to the house, and if you care to wait... How is she holding up, Harrison? Most admirably, Mr. Dollar, under the circumstances... Uh, Mr. Lamar's passing has been a terrible thing for her, for all of us. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. What'll happen to the house, I don't know. Won't Miss Lamar continue to live in it? This morning she said no, that she'd travel for a while, and then settle down somewhere else far away from the city. 
Oh? And what about you, the servants? Oh, we shall, of course, have to seek employment elsewhere. Say, tell me, Harrison, didn't Mr. Lamar provide for you in his will? I do not know, sir, and I do not particularly care. His kindness and loyalty to us during his lifetime was far more important than any provision he may have made for us. Well, I guess that takes you off the list. Uh, beg pardon? Nothing. So tell me, has Walter Marson been around much since Mr. Lamar's death? Yes, he's been most attentive to Miss Lamar, which we've all appreciated. He lives here in the house, you know. No, I didn't know. Harrison, I'd like to see his room. Sir? I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I'm an insurance investigator. Here. Here. My card. Why, I... Oh, I see. Miss Bonnie hadn't so informed me. Because she didn't know. Well, sir, Now I... show me to Marston's room. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Do you like Walter Marston? Yes, sir, very much. Now. What does that mean? I've never spoken of this to anyone else, Mr. Dollar. For years, Walter Marston was a clever, scheming, conniving young man with overpowering ambition to take over the Lamar Corporation. So I've heard... I'm convinced that at one time he even tried to marry Miss Lamar, and solely for the purpose of forcing his way into the business. Just tried? Well, yes, sir. However, in the past year or two, Mr. Marson has changed completely. What makes you think so? Because of conversations between him and Mr. Lamar that I could not avoid overhearing from time to time. Mr. Lamar knew what Marson was attempting and faced him with his knowledge of it. Uh, here is his room. Go on. Uh, Mr. Lamar could have made it very difficult for him in view of his record. Prison record? Uh, yes, sir, for embezzlement. But instead, he gave the young man another chance. So? Go on. And Mr. Marson made the most of it. He changed completely. I say without reservation, sir, that Mr. Marson is as honorable a young man as I know. Pretty sure of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. A butler living as close to them for both for so long can in very... Pardon me, sir, but... Does something give you the reason to think I'm mistaken? No, no. Unless perhaps it's this book I just found lying on his desk. Book, sir. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, and a switch that will make your head spin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Larry Comstock, Johnny, at Tri-Mutual Insurance. You're out at the Lamar home. Yeah, Larry. Police crime lab find out anything more about the stuff from here they took in for examination? Yes. Yes, they certainly did. Well... They found traces of that poison, pyrodameron, on the toothbrush that Thomas Lamar was using just before he on died. To Are you kidding? Oh, no. No, indeed, John. Not a bit. There's a murder weapon for you, a toothbrush. Larry, send the cops out here. I think I've just about got this case sewed up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location South Bend, Indiana. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is my final entry of expenses incurred during investigation of the Lamar murder. And murder it most certainly was. It was in La Jolla, California, during my so-called vacation, that I met, and I must admit, kind of fell for Vonnie Lamar. It was from La Jolla that I flew her back to South Bend, Indiana, when we both received news of her foster father's sudden death. All the clues I'd been able to dig up seemed to point to one Walter Marson who had been Lamar's personal secretary and who lived at the Lamar mansion. At his room there in the house, I found the one book in the world that described the poison, pyridamron, that had killed Thomas René Lamar. Poison derived from a pretty little yellow flower once raised on an island near Greece. A flower with sudden death in its pollen. Huh? You're Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Harrison the butler said you were up here. And you must be Walter Marston. What, uh... What are you doing in my room? 
Let me ask the questions, Marston. Now, just a minute. Look, mister, you may as well know it. I'm an insurance investigator. So Harrison said, but I don't believe it. Right here. My credentials. Uh-huh. Oh, I... I see, but I, I thought... You it... thought I was just a boyfriend that Vonnie Lamar met in La Jolla and who just came back here with her to comfort her over the loss of her father. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, you were wrong, mister. Or partly so. The main reason I'm here is to find out who murdered Thomas Lamar and why. And I think I've found out. You have? Well, well who, Mr. Dollar? Interesting book you've been reading here. Oh. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Stolen from the Central Library over in Chicago, wasn't it? Well, yes... Yes, it was. Found a poison in it, didn't you, Marston? Pyridameron. Deadly, quick, and hard to trace. So rare that the chances were pretty good it wouldn't even be recognized. But it was. Where'd you get it, Walter? As you said, at the library. I'm talking about the poison, the pyridameron that killed Thomas Lamar. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're all wrong. Am I? Who besides Vonnie would benefit from the million and a half insurance on Lamar's life? Well, what makes you think that... that I know that you I'd would. Be the... Because I know you're married to Vonnie. No. You tried I, to inveigle your way into Lamar's business, but he wouldn't have it. All your chiseling and conniving and phony stock transactions got you nowhere. So you did the next thing you could think of. You got something on Vonnie and forced her to marry you. So you thought you'd at least be sure of a big hunk of the insurance money over my dead oh, body. Oh, no, look, Dollar, maybe I was yeah, married to sure, Vonnie, but... I found out about her big gambling debts, got her off the hook by some fancy manipulation of her foster father's investments. No doubt threatened to tell him all about it unless she did marry you and thereby guaranteed yourself a prosperous future. Oh, and you timed the whole thing beautifully when she was emotionally upset over the death of Mrs. Lamar. No, Dolly, you, you don't know but what you're talking about. Couldn't wait for him to die a natural death. <sighs> Dolly. Dolly. Mr. Dolly. Sure, go ahead, speak up and make it good. Well, I, uh, I was married to Vonnie. But I'm not now. Sure. That's right. I did want a place in Lamar Metal Products, and I... I thought I could get it by showing Mr. Lamar how clever I was. <laughs> well, instead of throwing me out, he gave me another chance. I'll be forever grateful to him. It was a turning point in my life. I give you my word, Mr. Dollar, I've done nothing since that time that's been anything but completely honest and above board. Pretty speech. No, no, it, it's true. It's, it's true, I swear it. Nevertheless, you married Vonnie in the hope We're that... We're divorced. You're, you're What? Well, it was the only honorable thing I could do. Would you like to see the final papers? Vonnie mailed them to me from Reno before she went to La Jolla. You mean she... Yeah, let me see them. Here. My desk. Don't try to pull a gun out of there, Marcel. You... Still don't believe me, do you? Yeah. they are. Hmm... Then would you like to tell me who did murder Thomas Lamar? I wish to heaven I knew. That's why I got this book, hoping to find some clue as to where the pirate Dameron might have come from. But you sneaked this book out of the library. Because I was afraid of the very kind of suspicion that you've shown. Want to know something? I'm still showing. And I tell you, you're wrong. Ask Vani. She'll tell you. Where is she? Harrison said you two had gone out together to make arrangements for the funeral. Yes, we did, and we came back together. But when Harrison told her that you were here to see her, she... Well, she, she said she'd be back in a few minutes. Where did she go? Oh, she's still in the house somewhere, I, I think. Marson, just what is your relationship with Vonnie now? Well, there never was any love between us. Our marriage was only on paper. Yeah? As the foster daughter of the man to whom I owe so much, it's my duty to do what I can for her. In spite of her... Whatever well, what... Oh, even to the end, we, we kept from him any knowledge of her dissipations, her drinking and gambling. I thought that was all over. Oh, no, she's more deeply in debt now than she's ever been. I'm, I'm thankful Mr. Lamar died without knowing. Well, I'll be. But with the insurance, of course, you'll be able to pay off. Marson, you're a dirty rat, and your accusation isn't very well veiled. Are you trying to say that I'm accusing Vonnie of the... Murder. Oh, Mr. Dollar... Yeah, go on. This book. According to this, the plant from which Pyro Dameron is derived is now extinct. Unless somebody, somewhere, managed to salvage some seeds that were yes, then planted. Yes, exactly. Ruffer purpurus calendus, found only on a small Grecian island. I... 
I wonder if Dimitri would know about Dimitri? Him. What's this sudden switch? Who's Dimitri? He's the old gardener. He's, he's here on the estate. Come on, Marson, and bring that book. Before going out to the gardener's cottage, I asked Harrison where Vani had gone, and he told us he only knew that she was somewhere in the grounds, that her car was still in the driveway. I phoned Larry Comstock again, but he'd left his office, presumably to come out here. And I called the man I'd talked to earlier at the library. Of course I can. As I told you before, I keep a very close check on the books in that section. Uh, let me see now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Flora Exotica Mediterranea has only been out four or five times in the past several years. Once to a Mr. Thomas... Yeah? Uh, Thomas Hanley. Oh. Uh, to a Mr. Ralph Cummings, Miss Lavon Lamar, and... Uh, That's enough. Thanks. I tried not to show Marson how I felt as we walked out to the cottage of Dimitri, the old gardener. Could be nothing too nice for Mr. Lamar. So I always try to keep things nice. Yeah, I can see. Uh, Dimitri, Mr. Dollar's here to, to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Lamar's death. Investigate? Oh, yes. I hope you find who do this terrible thing to such a fine... Well, I want you to look at this book. Here. Did you ever see a flower like that? Oh, yes. Yes? Where? In old country. In Greece it used to be, but no more. You never saw it in this country? No, yes. Well, which is it? Uh, I should not say, because in old country it's against the law. I don't know why. Well, I do. Go on, Dimitri. But I keep many of my nice seeds anyway. And some of them were for this flower? Yes. You don't mind? It is very pretty flower. Did you ever plant any of them? Oh, no, no, not I. Somebody else? She was always so nice to me. Funny. Miss Lamar? <laughs> Look, sir. She even sent me gift on her trip last week. Dimitri. Look, look. You call it toilet case. See? It has soap and toothbrush and comb. Dollar. Dollar, look, look. That, that toothbrush. I am looking. The yellow stain on the bristles, the same color as the flower on this deadly plant. So, so pretty. She said her father, one of these two. Are... Oh, Dollar, I'm, I'm sick. You sick, poor so man? So crude, so corny. And so obvious it would never be noticed. And she was safely a couple of thousand miles away, beyond any possible suspicion when the... Dimitri, yes. did she plant any of these seeds you gave her? She often plant many kinds. Where? He's... Show us. In the morning, maybe. It's getting pretty dark now. Now, now, now. Come on. Come on, Marcel. Yeah. You, you, you must not tell her, I show you. She always keep her little garden secret. She not even think I know. She very sweet girl. Yeah, very. But now... You know, Oh, wait. Huh? She there now, cultivating. Cultivating? With a shovel? Dimitri, go back to your cottage and stay there. Oh, you want... Come on, Marson. She's, she's digging. Digging. And I think I know why. She sees us. Go back. Go away, both of you. Stay here. I want to talk to you, Vani. What are you doing? What I'm doing is... I, I'm burying the little garden that was mine for Daddy. Little personal things, Johnny, that I grew with my own hands for him alone. And now that he's gone, this would be only one more bit of memory. Please, leave me, Johnny, to finish. Wait, Bonnie. What? Before you turn under that little yellow flower. Here, I'll show you. No, Johnny, don't touch it. Here. Source of a poison called pyridamron. How did you know? Yeah, look. Oh, no, you don't. I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. Oh, nobody, no. Oh, Walter. Walter, help me. Help you, help you. Oh, was... Johnny was in love with me, but I turned him down, and he, he came out here. And... Oh, no good, Bonnie. I hate you. I hate you both. Everything would have been all right if you hadn't come along. I hate you. I. Listen, Johnny. Million dollars. Million and a half. You and I could... You no, Johnny, please don't! Please! Believe me, this is one case I wish I'd never seen. 
Oh, sure, you, the company, are all right. You won't have to pay off a million and a half in insurance. Your gain. But me, I've lost something. Faith. Faith and... I'm sick over the whole thing. Expense account, I'll add it up later. Right now, I'm going out and get roaring... Get some flowers. Some clean flowers. And just sit and look at them. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week, tell me... Did you ever wake up from a pleasant dream to find a smoking gun in your hand and two bodies at your feet? Well, I have. Join us next week, and I'll tell you about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, Howard McNair, John Daner, Gene Tatum, Joseph Kearns, Paul Richards, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs> 